This is the Crossing Bridges podcast, addressing the topics of leadership, criminal justice, and fatherhood. How can we become better leaders? Where are all the daddies? Why is crime at an all-time high? Here is your host, Bayonle Arashi. It's another exciting edition of the Crossing Bridges podcast. My name is Bayon Le Arashi. I'm always very excited coming your way, uh, bringing to you some of the top leaders uh, that are doing excellently well in different fields, men, women uh, that are changing the world in their own ways, uh, making the necessary difference to lead uh, from the front and to show the younger generation that truly together, we can have a better society. Uh, today, I have somebody very, very interesting that I'm sure uh, you, me, and every one of us listening and watching this podcast are definitely going to learn from his work, from his experience, from everything he has been through uh, to where he is at the moment. And of course, learning from there. Uh, it's my pleasure welcoming Sam Nikaboka. Sam, how are you doing today? I'm doing so great, so good. I'm grateful to be here. Uh, it's uh, I've listened to a few of your episodes and just really like the mission and the passion of what you're sharing. So I figured, you know, I'd, I have th- something to share and I'd want to be part of the conversation. Excellent. I mean, I, I also have the privilege to listen to a few of the episodes of your podcast because I have to put that out there that you're also a podcaster. And, and that's one of the things that actually um, attract me because someone... Uh, that has been through what you are going through and uh, that I've also uh, either choose to make excuses with his experience or decide to capitalize on it and use it as a form of strength. So let us get to meet you, Sam. Uh, introduce yourself to the uh, to the listeners and the people that are watching the podcast. Yeah, so name Sam Knickerbocker, as you mentioned, and um, been, been on this journey of really self-discovery and focusing on how can we mend relationships with people across uh, different cultures, different ethnicities, and ultimately even inside of ourselves, right? I think a lot of the the bridges that need to be mended are inside of ourselves. And then once we mend those bridges, then we're able to step outside of ourselves and see where else we can add that value. Uh, For me, I grew up seventh of 11 kids in not the best circumstances uh, monetarily or circumstantially, in a little town, Grantsville, Utah, parents were pizza drivers, occasional, uh, we would go dumpster diving for certain parts of our food, just very simple things. But I grew up, there was not a lot of financial resources and there was not a lot of stability. And what that bred inside of us often was, um, there was elements of anxiety, depression, elements of domestic violence, just things that often come when there's a lack of financial security or stability in a home. And so I successfully made it out of that, right? Became an entrepreneur, ultimately went to school for um, neuropsychology. I wanted to figure out how could I help families and individuals avoid a lot of the things that I went through as a child. And what I found in the process of doing that was that real change was gonna happen in the preventative space rather than the reparative space. And so I shifted all my focus into how can we prevent a lot of this breakdown in the family from happening in the first place, rather than always trying to repair what was going on on the back end. Wow, that's that's such a packed and a powerful story. And I really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, two takeaway for me um, that you said that your mindset obviously um, is a very strong one, which I think it is actually where every one of us need to start if we want any form of change in our life, the mindset is the number one thing to change. And you just said it, that you started looking at things from a preventable stage. Um, And of course, coming from the role of seventh, you say your role is seventh out of 11. Tell me more about that. How many siblings do you have? Which uh, You have boys, girls ahead of you, uh, boys and girls behind you. And how was the family circle? How is dad and how, how did mom do it? Yeah, well, and that was a big part of what was dysfunctional was uh, some women and some men, they're really okay having lots of children and it's natural and there's not a problem. Other people, 
they just don't have the capacity in lots of different areas of their life, not just love or, or delivery, um, but they just don't have the capacity to really parent that many people well. Um, and that's where I feel like my mom and dad were. They, it, on one hand, on one hand, because they also had a very intense objective, which I'll explain in a minute. But I'm the, out of the seventh of 11, there's six older than me, and there was four younger than me. My little sister, she just passed away from cancer about a year and a few months ago. So, uh, so there's 10 surviving children. Uh, so there's seven boys, four girls. There was two girls, two boys younger than me. So I think there's five, no, four. So there's four boys older than me and two girls older than me. And then there was two boys and two girls younger than me. Um, and yeah, I mean, great, great family. We made it to the other side. Not everybody's so lucky. You know, sometimes when you're raised in, a, in not very good circumstance and parents are at their wits end and they're losing it, sometimes the best option might be to actually remove yourself from the situation, get out and have the state come in and take over. I would say most of the time, though, um, with if the focuses are right and the intentions are right, then things can be worked through. And that's where I would go back to my parents. My parents had an objective of raising each of us children to be completely independent and self-sustaining at age of 14. To accomplish that goal in any child, you're gonna have to ride them a little bit harder than you might think the next person needs to be ridden. You're gonna have to expect more. You're gonna have to believe in them more. And so although my childhood was didn't feel much like a childhood, it wasn't super comfortable, my parents had high expectations of what they were creating. And they were not very easy, in my opinion, uh, of expecting that change, right? They, they wanted what they wanted and they weren't gonna settle for less. And I'm grateful that they didn't. Now looking back, I'm so grateful that they didn't. While I was going through it, I didn't like it, but who does like going through intense training? I mean, go take the Navy SEALs. Do you think the Navy SEALs or the Marines or anybody, do you think they love Hell Week? No, they don't love Hell Week, but they understand the value of it. And especially on the other side, they understand that it's a necessity for to creating who they want to become. And now on the other side of my childhood, I'm so grateful that my parents didn't give in, that they didn't succumb to whatever the world standard of what a child should be like or how parenting should be, but they focused in on what they wanted to accomplish. They accomplished it and they created ultimately 11 very successful, most of us entrepreneurs, um, individuals who are really thriving at life and also focused on giving back to society, not just winning for ourselves, but really focused on service and love for the people around us. So I think they won and they did it right, even though it was hard. Absolutely. I have to agree with you that they won. Uh, I mean, I used to, I mean, co coming from an immigrant background, and I know you and I had a conversation before uh, we're actually um, uh, having this particular recording of this podcast. I, I, I would never think that you come from such a very a strong and a compound uh, family background. and But hearing this story uh, further confirms that really it's making a difference and making a change and raising right kids in the right way. It's only for people that are willing to put in the work. And obviously, uh, your parents did. I mean, we're hearing that one woman and one man did the job of raising 11 successful individuals. And I'm sorry for the loss of your sister, uh, that you lost recently. Uh, but one interesting question that I want to ask you is with the boys, with four boys ahead of you, um, how was growing up in that household? How was it for you uh, growing up as a young man? Uh, what can you remember? What were the fun thing? How did your dad uh, balance between uh, each and every one of you? And what? how did they deal with the space in between the kids? Yeah, so it's an interesting perspective um, that I'm going to share. And I've heard from many of my siblings, you know, if, when they hear my perspective, they say, well, that's not how it really was. And here's, <laughs> here's my opinion about life. Your reality is your reality. It doesn't really matter what the facts are, because as far as the facts, how you perceive your reality, and those are your facts. And those are the things that affect you. Now, whether they factually happened or somebody else saw it from that angle doesn't actually matter. You have to be willing to be honest with what you experienced. And then once you're honest with what you experienced, you're able to go and hear other people's perspectives and maybe help enhance or, or change your experience. But to completely shut your experience down and say, no, gaslight, you didn't experience that. That's not how it was. I think that's disingenuous and actually 
discredits healing. It doesn't promote healing in a family. And so the first thing is if you've experienced trauma or you believe you've experienced trauma and a family member or somebody close to you says, no, that's not how it was, um, first get comfortable with owning your truth and then be willing to consider that maybe they're right. Maybe it didn't happen. And this will get into one of the questions you'll ask later probably about how I've come out of like re really restructuring my brain. But I want to get into this as far as my dad. My dad actually, for the first probably five or six years of my life, he was a pizza driver and my and my mom worked at a place, a construction company as an accountant. And so my dad was home most of my childhood uh, up until that, up until probably six or seven. Then he started working at a telephone company and he always worked nights. And so he was home all day, but he was sleeping. And so for a lot of my childhood, I don't really feel like I knew my dad. Okay. So that's the first thing is like, I, I knew my dad when I was younger, he would read us books. He was really attentive. And then right around six, seven, when he got a, a job, he wasn't really around much anymore from a, from a fatherly perspective. That being said, he did teach us skills of working on cars. He taught us skills of construction. Like he was around enough to teach us life skills, but not really um, what I thought a father would be doing. Okay. As from a child. Yeah, wasn't there emotionally. And my mom wasn't really there emotionally either because she was um, at that point in time, her body was having child after child after child, pregnant or breastfeeding for over 25 years. I mean, just think about the emotional trauma and stress your body would be under. I'm glad I'm not a woman. Um, but uh, my brothers, all of us, because life at home was often untenable, it was not a very fun place to be, then a lot of the siblings, we moved out where we found other families very early in life. Now, I think um, this actually is something that's very good parenting that sometimes we look at and we think, well, that was neglectful maybe. From a biological perspective, animals don't want to create inbreeding. And so when they reach a certain age, they actually run away. They go do other things before they come back to a pack. And this is like basic tribalism back to the, the beginning. And so there's a period of time in your adolescent years where your genetic makeup says you need to get away from your family. You're, you're smarter. You know everything and your parents know nothing, right? Because they, they want your, your species wants to survive with the least amount of deformities, okay? And so you got to get away from that, that time period in your life. Well, as a parent, what I love that my parents did is they built great friendships with other parents, other mentors that they felt comfortable with us spending time with and us learning from. They had similar morals, values, um, purposes in life. And so we... I would say a lot of who I became didn't necessarily come directly from my parents. It came from tangential relationships that they introduced to us at a young age and said, hey, you can spend as much time as you want with him. You can spend as much time as you want with her. You can spend as much time as you want with their family because they knew that we would be taught similar true principles that were valuable to them. And that, I think, is a sign of a really good parent. I hope that I can be the same thing. And in fact, my wife and I right now, one of the main focuses of our relationship right now is trying to find other families or other couples that we really connect with. Both, both of us connect with each other on a deep level as far as our core beliefs and what we're trying to accomplish in life. Because we believe that once we can find those relationships, then we're going to have families that can be raised together. And, and that's really important to me that we find families that can be raised together, not just like our nuclear family, but a, a community of people that we feel comfortable mentoring our children. And that's what I think our parents did really well. So I would say growing up with my brothers, there wasn't a lot of competition, but there also wasn't a lot of anything because they moved out early. I moved out when I was 14 um, and moved in with my second oldest brother uh, because I didn't want to be at home anymore because of situations there. <clears throat> and so it's just really interesting, you know, like learning what is valuable in a in a parenting slash child situation from a hindsight and then trying to recreate that's a it's an interesting experience for sure absolutely sam i mean your story let me just say this like it, it seems that this episode might be one of those episodes that we will have to like cut into two and do a, a part one and part two because it is very important for 
um, us. And that's one of the reasons why a podcast like this was established for people to start sharing a story of what a family used to be like. Because you and I can agree uh, absolutely that things have changed in our own generation. I'm 42 years old um, and I know that while my parents were, while I was in the house, while I was growing up in the house, my parents were always uh, to, we always eating together at night. We were also doing stuff together uh, while we were growing up. But these days, that no longer that is no longer tenable. Also, you said something very very um, important that I think in uh, in, in an African American home. I grew up in a Nigerian home to be precise. Um, we call something like it takes a village to raise a kid. Um, so, which means. Uh, mm -hmm. Your culture also has something like that with me. There, there was a community of people that your parents worked with, uh, even though they were not there really as you wanted. But you said, and I'm so proud of you saying that and giving them that credit, that they still made it, they still made it an effort to make sure you grow up around people that can discipline you, that can call you to action, that can call you to correction, that can say, hey, son, this is how to go. And that is one of the key things that we have lost today which is one of the reasons which going to be my next question you said it earlier now that you with all those uh, challenges I, because i won't call those negativities right but they were challenges they could have either mm -hmm. hinder you and uh take you towards a path of uh, crime towards path of um, not wanting to be somebody in life but look at you today um you are in neuropsychology uh, you are very educated. You are now making change. Uh, how did you uh, change your mindset? How did you? How are you able to develop yourself uh, to become who you are today, despite all the odds that were standing in front of you and with the kind of background you came from? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. For me, I really believe that my my purpose or or my change came down to first having a clear de determination of where I wanted to go. My, my objective hasn't changed at all really since I was 15, 16 years old. I have a deep belief that we need more love in the world, that we need more kindness. We need to share that love and everybody needs to feel loved. Everybody needs to feel like they have valid uh, connection. And because of that experience, then that's been like my trajectory. How do I help more people experience this? And even myself, because we all have different things in our life, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them trauma, but I think the best analogy is if you've ever watched the Bugs Life movie. Okay, in the very first scene of the Bugs Life, not the people playing chess, but the first scene when the leaf falls, you're, the leaf falls on the, on the line where the ants are walking. And so then they start freaking out because they feel like they lost the line. And then they have an older, wiser ant come and direct the ants around the leaf, and then they continue to harvest the food. Well, your mind works like that, okay? Your mind has this, your body is an electrical circuit, okay? And when you have a disruption in the electrical circuit, like the leaf falling on the line, there's a disruption. And then your mind, your, your brain's job, primary function, it has a lot of functions, but its primary function is to keep you safe and away from harm and alive. Like that is its job. And so immediately when we have these experiences that cause pain, misunderstanding, guilt, shame, whatever, your brain reroutes a path around that experience as fast as possible so that you don't feel like you're crazy and that you can continue with your life as a sane, well-adjusted, quote-unquote, human being. Well, the problem is that these traumas are, are basically, our whole life is built around avoiding those traumas. That's our whole life. Like it's, it's rerouted around avoiding these traumas. Now, those traumas generally they don't have to be big things. They can be the first time you got spanked. They could be the first time that you got told no. They could be the first time that somebody gave you a dirty look. They could be the first time somebody ignored you when you thought you were being paid attention to. They don't have to be significant sexual abuse or something crazy. They could be simple things that are causing trauma, that are causing decisions, identity decisions about who we are, what our value is in the world. And when that happens, your brain's job is to protect you from it. It's very unlikely that you're going to get access to that experience unless you feel comfortable enough having access to that experience. And this is where, for me, I realized that when I was studying neuropsychology that I probably had these experiences, but I didn't know how to access them. I didn't know how to reframe them. And this is where I think it's really important. I wrote a journal about it. You can find it on Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Amazon. 
It's called Identify Your Identity, Redefine Your Defining Moments. And I believe that not only can we change the future in our lives, but we can change the past. Not just figuratively, but literally from a, from a brain wiring perspective, we can alter the past on our past experiences. So how do we do that? With the right set of questions. Because you can't do it for me, I can't do it for you. The best that we can do is we can ask each other the right questions so that our brain goes to answer the questions in a certain way. As your brain starts to answer the question in a certain way, it starts to rebuild a healthy pathway. Okay? And so this is my four questions that I believe is able to primarily transform, transform and help me become this well-adjusted person that I am. And I'm putting that in scare quotes or whatever because like I still got a long way to go. I'm still growing. So I don't know that I'm the most well-adjusted. But here, here's the four questions for transformation, identifying your identity, and redefining your defining moments. First question is, what are the facts? What factually happened? And when you're writing down the facts, don't write any emotion. Don't write how you feel about it. Don't write what you think somebody else thought, did, said, whatever. Only write down the facts. That's the first step. The second step is then you write down how you feel about the facts. Write down all of your feelings, the good, the bad, the sad, the ugly. Okay. Then the next question is what could also be true? What might also be true? Did my parents really not like me and that's why they were cruel to me as a child? Or were they trying to develop somebody who was self-sustaining at 14 and they did the best that they could because they loved me and they were going to not give in to what other people thought should happen? Right? So how you frame something completely changes how you feel about it. Lastly, is how are you grateful for that experience and what did you learn from it? So if you ask these four questions, what are the facts? How do the facts make you feel? What could also be true about the facts or what, could, what other things could be true? And then lastly, why are you grateful and what did you learn from it? That psychologically reprograms your brain to take every experience, good, bad, ugly, every experience, and leads it straight through love and gratitude. It leads it straight through, I'm gonna give everybody the best benefit of the doubt. What was their motives, the best motives? The reason this is important is you may not have access to those past experiences yet. However, if you can start rewriting your current experiences on a daily basis, then just like a 3D glasses, you start to shift the lens that you view life through. And as you start to shift the lens that you view life through, your brain starts to look backwards into these experiences and say, those experiences aren't all that bad because now I view all of those experiences from a position of love and gratitude rather than a position of fear and harm. And then your biggest liabilities become your greatest assets in life. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, I, I, I already said it. I am so grateful for your wealth of knowledge, uh, for the value you've added for the last 20 minutes that we've been on this. And again, I am I'm definitely sure we'll keep going. And if we uh, exceed our time, we'll definitely make sure this continue, this conversation continues uh, in the next episode of the show. Uh, but I still want you to uh, share, because I know you already shared the, 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 the practical uh, steps that you took, uh, which means, which can summarily be defined as, like, okay, you educated yourself, you self-educate yourself, right? So how did that transition happen? Did you have mentor? Did you go to school for it? Uh, did somebody just pick you up? And, or how, how did it happen? How did, how did your evolution happen? And what do you hope to achieve from now that you have you are where you are now and you have this stage? What do you hope to achieve going forward? Sure. So I think a lot of my evolution happened with a, a great mentor of mine named Paul Venable. He's a, we, I grew up in a small town, 2,000 people, Parma, Idaho. There's nothing, there's not very many people there. He was the only African American in town and he was my best friend. He was probably 30 years older than me again, probably my parents' age, but I got to spend a lot of time with him walking around the town. And he had a lot of perspective on life that was extremely valuable. He came from Ohio, so he came from a, a di very different uh, era in, in growing up, different experiences, and he was willing to share those with me. But most of all, he helped me believe that I had value and worth regardless of anybody else. And so that was a big, um, seated belief in me that I could be whoever I wanted to be and I could create whatever value I wanted. As far as how it changed, 
I have been keeping a journal. Well, I have been. I've actually fallen off and haven't done it in probably two or three years. But by the time I got married, I had been keeping a journal from age eight years old to 24 years old almost every day. It's a long time to keep a journal, daily journal. And in that process, I practiced lots of different ways to rewrite my stories, to rewrite what I was experiencing into a positive light. I knew that the power of writing was valuable. And so it was really a gradual change that I got to this point. But I think that anybody can get there. And I'm just, pat my passion as far as where am I going, I just want to help people get to a place where they experience life through gratitude. They experience life through love and abundance. They experience life through connection. And that's going to happen when we get connected with ourselves first. Once we understand ourselves, all the good and the bad, and we get comfortable with it, it's so much easier to be compassionate for, with others. So much easier to be grateful because rather than judging somebody for how they showed up in life, we can then look at them and say, I wonder what motivated them to do that. I've been in circumstances where I've been motivated to do dumb things. I wonder if they're suffering from something similar. And we can go have a conversation with these people rather than like, hey, that person did this terrible, horrible thing. Look, unfortunately they did, but why? Why? And, and what was the motive? Who didn't love them? Where did they not see that there was more value by loving somebody than by hating somebody? And these are the questions that I ask myself a lot. Like, how can I help people believe in their value more? And that's really my focus in life is I believe you're worth being remembered. I believe you have a unique gift and skill to share with the world. And I want to help you bring that out and share it with the world. The conversation with Sam Nikaboka was so intense and so educative uh, that it has to be uh, a two-episode uh, podcast. Uh, so this is going to be the end of uh, the first episode of the first part uh, of that uh, interview uh, with Sam Nikaboka. Uh, definitely next week, uh, the continuous uh, part of it uh, will be on uh, the podcast. So, but for now, uh, I have to say uh, thank you for listening and for watching. And uh, definitely next time, you're going to see uh, the concluding part of uh, my uh, interview with uh, Sam Nikaboka, a very great guy uh, with a very interesting story uh, growing up in that uh, very strong family of 11, 11 kids um, uh, from, from, from Idaho. Uh, it's very, very interesting, I assure you. So make sure you listen uh, to, the to the concluding part of that interview. Uh, next week on the Crossing Bridges podcast. Uh, till I see you guys uh, next week, God willing. Uh, my name is Bayon Lee Arashi. Uh, it's been my pleasure bringing the podcast to you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Crossing Bridges podcast with Bayonle Arashi. Your comments, suggestions, and ideas are welcome. Follow Bayonle on all social media platforms at Bayonle Arashi or visit www.bionlearashi.com for coaching and speaking engagements. See you next time.